Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Round Rant. Today I am joined by professional rugby coach Paul Gustart. You may know him from coaching teams such as England's Harlequin Saracens and most recently has taken up a role with Treviso ahead of the 2021-22 season. So firstly, Paul, thanks a million for taking time out. I know you've got a busy schedule today and uh, how's all uh, with you? All good, mate. Thanks thanks for having me. Uh, it's good to talk rugby and uh, I'm currently doing a bit of gardening work. So it's uh, it's a welcome relief to my back and my spine and my Overly tight hamstrings for a 45-year-old man that doesn't do enough stretching. Well, I'm glad to be a uh, relief for the next while. So just normally when I get people on, we talk about childhoods and stuff like that, but I don't want to waste a, a good rugby brain on stuff like that. So your playing career, you were at three very like well-known clubs, all with different identities, different cultures, different mindsets, different players. You could go on and on. And your first club was Leicester, and that was during a time where they were renowned for being a hard-nosed, tough culture, really successful. And you obviously had the likes of Martin Johnson at the helm there, leading the charge, so to say. What did you take from that? Because obviously perspective now, you've gone through your playing career now as a coach. Like, What were some of the lessons learned or even some of the traits you could take from a period like that with such a hard-nosed, successful culture? Yeah, look, I, I think firstly, I, I look back at all three clubs I played at with, with different memories uh, and different fondness. You know, they all gave me something different. One as a, as a human being and how I want to live my life. Uh, and then secondly, as a rugby player. And then obviously now that I'm as a professional rugby coach, um, some of the qualities and some of the habits and behaviours that I think are important for success. Um, to, to specifically talk about Leicester uh, brings back lots of good memories. It's 20 years um, this, this, this June that we won the first uh, Hanning Cup trophy for the club. So there's a big reunion gathering if, uh, if COVID allows us, which we'll be looking forward to. But I think, I think the first thing when I think of Leicester is um, that the tightness of the squad uh, was incredible. It's obviously a big rugby town. Um, historically, it's always been a successful um, strong forward orientated team that used to battle consistently with Bath and uh, had some good old tussles with Northampton as well. And the one thing that plays in my mind a lot is it was a big kind of team first mentality. Mm. And, um, but by that, I mean, I know people bandy the words around, but there was no one bigger than the team. And, and the easiest way to kind of highlight that, I guess, would be to talk about the most famous uh, Tiger of them all, which would be Martin Johnson. And, um, you know, Austin Healy might have some. Uh, remarks around that but um, you know yeah. we went to Benidorm and a stag do and no one knew who Austin was and everyone knew who Jono was so uh, <laughs> I'd say Jono was the big fish and um, he would come back from England on a Monday from the Six Nations uh, probably beating Ireland um, you know away. <laughs> and um, you know on that Monday he'd be in he'd be training he'd be in the same gym session as everybody else he'd train in the afternoon Tuesday uh, notoriously at Tigers was a very physical training session uh, often leading to some kind of altercation between some players, normally Richard Cockrell, and uh, John would be in the thick of it. And then he'd front up and deliver again the next weekend. So I, I think that one showed me, as I said, a team-first mindset, that the club was was important to people. Uh, the success of Leicester was important to people. Um, the harmony of the club was important to people. And uh, and that also showed me humility. You know, if, if arguably the most famous um, English rugby player uh, of all time, um, can come back on a Monday, having given his body and given his mind and his effort and all that's required to play international sport, and then to come straight back in and lead the charge again, not just on the Saturday, but in the training week, uh, was incredible. And that obviously then drifted into the rest of the England internationals and Scottish internationals and Welsh internationals, and then all the young kids like myself that were starting to come through. So I think that kind of team-first mentality, um, we had a very, very strong brotherhood you know the, the the connection between people was real the connection between people was was constant and we invested in each other it, it's easy to talk about um friendship mateship teamship but but all these things require an investment required to do something it doesn't just happen yet you have to want to try and spend time with people and the easiest way to explain that i guess is everything in life is a choice i can either choose to spend time with my teammates now i can choose to spend time with my coaches I can choose to spend time with senior players, junior players, and so on. I can choose to spend time investing in um, in others. And, and, I, and I felt at Leicester that happened uh, consistently, constantly, either through the recruitment that we had, the personnel that came into the club, 
and because people just generally like each other. You know, we used to fight a little bit on a Tuesday, but but you know afterwards. Uh, and you've got a black eye, and Darren Garforth's apologising to you for the for the fifth time of the season. Um, <clears throat> you know, nice you go out for a beer, you know, and it was just, it was just so tight, and it was so close. Um, you know, winning helps, of course. You know, we're very successful, and winning helps, and you know, winning often masks a multitude of sins. Um, but but I generally generally felt there was a genuine deep connection between people, and uh, we respected each other, and we, and we played for each other, we drank with each other, we'd be best men at each other's weddings. Um, we've you know done done some incredible things together as a group of group of players, and I think um, you know I think it was a really special time of, of of my playing career. Yeah, no, well said, and I'm sure that you could spend two three hours going over the training ground bust ups and the the fallouts and the the hugs after that. And you then played for London Irish and Saracens as a player, and your first. Your first coaching role was with Saracens, but it's even current players that I know in the in the pro game. I'm always intrigued as there's a reason. Like I was listening to a, the high performance podcast, Stephen Jared said he had no intention of ever being a coach. But then after the hardship of losing a league with Liverpool, it changed his mind. He wanted to chase that rush, that success. Did you always want to be a coach or did someone at Saracens, when your time was coming to the end as a player, did someone convince you to do it? Um, in short, no, I, I, I didn't. I mean, I wanted to coach, but I didn't necessarily want to coach professionally. Um, I, I always felt, I'm always thankful, just as we all are, that play, play sport as a kid. Uh, for the men, the women that give up their time on a Sunday morning, uh, evenings to, to take you through sessions. And they might not have the knowledge or the intellect uh, of that sport um, or you know the, the in-depth stuff that we now know about game and, and periodization and, and maturation and uh, mental well-being and all these kind of things now that make up heavy components of a of a, of a sporting program. Uh, and I thought, obviously, I haven't played professional rugby for, for twelve years. Played for England a couple of times. Played for England A, England Sevens, that kind of stuff. I had some some form of knowledge that I could pass on and try and help and give back to the, to the community if you like to give back to the game and. I did law at university, so I was looking to explore something like that. And um, as it happened, in my my second year at Saracens, I was t- just turned 32. I had a lot of shoulder problems and uh, neck problems. And uh, Eddie Jones was the incoming head coach. And there's two ways to, to, to look at this. Eddie either recruited me as a coach or he retired me as a player. And knowing Eddie, I think he retired me as a player and um, and offered me offered me a role in um, in, in a skills capacity. And I started off um, doing doing all sorts, really. But to, to get the position after the initial conversation with Eddie, when he said, "Look, you know, we can we can still extend your contract, but you know, I think you made a good coach. I'd like to I'd like to get you on board. We're going to change the coaching team around. Um, we want some younger coaches, and uh, he's got one other experienced coach in. There was Eddie uh, Alex Anderson, who, who'd retired unfortunately due to due to injury himself, and uh, he said, "I'd like to get you on board." Thought great, so I had a lot of conversations. Turned down some other opportunities to play, and um, then he said, "Right, uh, okay, you, need, you now need to do this assignment and, and apply for the job." And I was kind of thinking, "What about the conversation we had where you thought I'd yeah. make a good coach?" I thought I was going to get the gig, and I did two assignments from it. And, and to be fair, it showed the kind of depth that Eddie thought about the game. Even then, uh, it showed um, the, the amount of detail, d- detail and pedagogy that's involved in coaching. It's not just walking off what, the field with your boots and then put on a tracksuit and a whistle and, and you're the authority on things because there's a learning process, uh, which is important. You know, let, let's take it for granted that most uh, ex-professional players have a, have a breadth of knowledge uh, and are able to talk articulately about the game, uh, to be able to come up with drills and games and experiences that they've had. But it's how you, you put it all together and how you build a program and how you build a progression. And, um, you know, those two or three things I did with Eddie uh, really, really got, got me excited and uh, that was the start of the journey. You know, that's gone back now, you know, 15 years ago or so, 14 years ago now. And Eddie obviously was also the person that lent up me to England when he got the England job. So I'm forever thankful for Eddie for giving me the opportunity. Um, forever thankful for Saracens on, on a multitude of levels. But but certainly from a, from a playing perspective, I love my time there. And then to, to help nurture me and, and uh, help me grow and allow me to grow and to mark and the rest of the organisation at Saracens is just a fantastic club. Uh, they get a lot of things right. Yeah. And it's interesting you touched on it there where like Eddie kind of led you on a little bit, was like, yeah, yeah, we'll take you on. And then was like, actually, hang on, here's some assignments for you. Like when I think of myself and it may have been different with yourself, 
like when I say went from schoolboy rugby player to schoolboy coach in, in my school, St. Michael's, me as a player, I was very much played with a smile on my face, always had the crack, sometimes to the coaches and the team's detriment, which I was all too aware of at certain stages. But then as a coach, I realized I have to set an example here. As you said, you need to plan it. You need to manage. You as a player probably, well, you can answer this better than I can only presume. Did you have to make any adjustments mentally or even just how to approach, like how you approach relationships, transition from player to coach? Because there's certain things you can do as a player that you can get away with when talking to someone. And then likewise, when you're a coach, you need to treat people differently. You need to treat the coaches differently. Your perspective on the game changes. Like, how did you find that transition? And if so, like what changes did you make to yourself? Yeah, look, it, it, it's a great question. It's great reflections, isn't it? It's, I, I think, I think the first thing is you have to be authentic. You know, I think you have to be true to yourself. You know, rather be the best version of yourself than a poor imitation of somebody else. And uh, for certain, I've not always got this right. You know, but uh, probably as a player, I was, I was good fun to be around. Um, you know, I was you know heavily involved in social and uh, making sure people are happy, into relationship building and you know emotional intelligence and, and making sure everyone was all right and. Uh, giving to the team and so on. And then then as your coaching journey starts and you start adopting different roles, you suddenly start moving away a little bit from the playing group. Um, just just through age as much as anything else, you know, you, you're suddenly no longer 30 to 32 and you're a senior player, you know, 38 to 40. And, you know, the players come through 2022 and, you, and you've got to find a way to resonate and connect with the people on a different level. And ultimately, ultimately, you know, whilst we want to have fun, and we want to we want to enjoy our time with the players, and we want them to enjoy the experience, which we do. Of course, enjoyment is a massive part of our game, and we can never lean too far away from that. Is we're also there to help educate, and we're also there to help them maximise their opportunity to play. And that could be at whatever level. It could be a school first team. Uh, it could be it could be the third team. It could be a vets team. It could be what you know. It could be professional. It could be elite. It could be British line. Whatever the level is, you know, your job as a coach, I believe, is to, is to try and facilitate an environment where the player has a chance to excel and achieve those things. And ultimately, although we talk about friendship and mateship and, and having fun, ultimately we need the players, I believe, uh, to respect you. Because if they respect you, then you're probably getting something quite right, you know, because they, they understand, and, and I understood as a player, that even if a coach can be giving me feedback, like feedback isn't criticism. Feedback is critical to improve, and then it's a, it's a small nuance and it's a small difference in the play and words. But if you if you have a good relationship um, with your players and they respect you, then they they're in a position of of trust and safety where they can receive information and grow. And as I said, having fun and having a crap with the boys is still important. And um, I think you know falling falling over yourself drunk and stuff in, in front of them probably is not always the best thing to do, but also shows the vulnerability and the human side to to you as well because we all make mistakes you know we, we, all, we all screw up from time to time and you know we're no different to the players in that regard players can play badly on a day I can coach badly on a day I can give a poor presentation on a day uh, I, can, I can get something wrong I can get a conversation wrong um, I can get feedback uh, wrong or inaccurate I, I act on emotion instead of detail or I act too much on detail and not contextual and you know I, I think again you, if you've got the relationship with the player and if you're authentic with the way that you manage your relationships and how you communicate to that person on an individual level then then you're never going to go too far wrong yeah well said and i think it is it's definitely an important thing and even eddie jones alludes to it a lot in like podcast he does it's just that emotional side of rugby and how players now are different to what they were 20 years ago having that emotional intelligence is it's absolutely vital and you started off with saracens in your coaching gig and I remember what was it two years ago? Two years ago now, Alex Good was on the show and he was talking about how Brendan Venter came in, and I think you were there maybe several months before he came in, and there was accent of players. They had a term for it, but it escapes escapes my mind. But Alex was saying he came in, got rid of like sixteen, eighteen contracted guys, brought in new players from South Africa, all over the world changed the culture, changed the expectations, changed the values across the board. And you being a part of that as a coach, like what what was that like? Because obviously now the journey Saracens have come, come on, especially 10, 11, 12 years up until obviously the, the controversy of the last six, 12 months. 
it's been just a one way ticket to success. But obviously, at the start, there was a few bumps in the road. But what was it like being a part of that setup at an early stage? Look, I, th- I think I mean I, I don't even coaching for a year. So I, I, you know, some of these guys like Alex Good, I actually played my last game. I played with Alex his first game, my last game. Um, first year I was coaching with Eddie, we, we were up and down. Eddie, Eddie tried to change the team a little bit. The team was getting a little bit old. And uh, he was trying to bring in something different. And, you know, he's trying to deepen the squad. Uh, Brendan came in around February time uh, with a new CEO. And they were, they were very well aligned. Uh, they were aligned with the owners. They were aligned with the board about the direction of travel they wanted to go in. So there was probably, as you say, 16 maybe players that were contracted, plus another 10 that weren't, that were all moved on. And uh, another group, which was tough. It was a tough month. It was a tough Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, it was people going in, being told they were going to be staying or going. And, and, you know, we had to cancel training that day and everyone went out for, for some beers and stuff because it's, it's tough news. There's people with yeah. mortgages, there's people with jobs, there's people with uh, families and, and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's never a nice thing to do. Um, you know, the club honor, the contracts and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's, still a, it's still a tough thing when you get rejection. You know, it's one of people's four fatal fears, you know, um, losing, rejection, criticism and non-selection probably in a rugby sense. Um, so look, it was, it was, it was, that period was different, but then when the summer starts, the new group of boys are in there, um, you know, there's fresh optimism, you know, I've been involved in teams throughout my career where you've been on varying levels of success. And, um, you know, if I take London Irish as an example, we had one season where we just narrowly avoided relegation the last game of the season. We sat in there first day of pre-season talking about finishing top four, you know, that, that people, people forget, you know, time heals a lot of things. And, um, what was very clear was that, as I said, the CEO and, and Brendan were, were very aligned. They wanted to be a, a value-based club. Um, there, there's a there's an urban myth, I think, that's often kind of talked around Saracens, around Edward speaking to Richard Hill, probably you know Saracens' greatest uh, greatest ever Saracen, if you like, and uh, saying, so, you know, what are Saracens? If you if you look at Leicester, it's probably quite clear to see culturally and identity about what what, what Leicester were and what Leicester are now becoming again. And, um, you know, Richard probably didn't answer the question how Edward thought he might have done. And almost, you know, there's a, there's a vagueness around a, a lack of a lack of clarity about what, what the club stood for. So it came on three values initially, which was honesty, work rate and discipline. Humility came after after the first premiership win. Um, but the club was, was, was very clear about what it was. We, we went uh, for an enjoyment factor. We changed the training programme. And I say we colloquially because it was Brendan's vision and uh, Brendan's idea. Uh, coaching staff changed. And, and to be honest, we, we, we fell, not lucky, but, but the, the first kind of year, we went on a run of like nine wins from nine. And, you know, the, I, was, I just became the defence coach that year. Our skills coach under Eddie was defence and forwards coach the next year. I think we only conceded like 22 tries that entire season, but but the, but the laws changed. The laws changed where it was just not worth you having the ball. And Brendan, with the, with his attention to detail, and um, you know, he, he sees things very black and white. Brendan, and and he was like, well, there's no point having the ball. We play three phases and, and kick. And some people might see some teams doing that now, of course, but but it was so simple, so basic that all we did was defend and training. All we did was defend and training. Play a target start, play with Brad Barrett, uh, run the corner somebody else, and then kick, and then chase like mad things, you know. And that was kind of a blueprint. We shocked people, and and two or three, we had two or three real star players like Scott Britz was just 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 an incredible, incredible, freak. incredible athlete and player. Just can do things that just take your breath away. And um, his biggest issue normally is that he gets bored of being special. You know, he wants to do something more special the next time. And I, I think that, that that whole change and understanding and, and actually, you know, we then underwrote behaviours to the values. Um, you know, the players co-created that. And, you know, as I said, winning winning definitely helped because we, we narrowly won games. Then we lost six or seven games uh, after that run of nine when the laws kind of changed and, and, and allowed probably more... Uh, more attacking leeway around the breakdown because before you could just turn the ball over quite easy. And um, we lost six or seven games, went down to Brighton. And as Saracens have, have done many, many times over since, um, went out with some beers, um, had, a, had a heart-to-heart. And from the back of it, completely flipped, completely flipped from being this most structured territorial team in three phases to a pod system team that everyone talks about now, like a one three three one or two four two or one three two one one and whatever. Um, it was like that, and Glenn Jackson was just pulling the strings and just carved up teams uh, for, the, for the second half of the season. End up going to the final against Leicester and losing. 
And that was kind of the start of it. And then there was enough belief and there was enough confidence and off the back of it, two or three, you know, more signings came in, more signings, improve, improvement in the squad signings came in. Some of the youngsters now are now rubbing shoulders with the Sculpritzes, um, the Ernst Jubers, um, you know, the Steve Borthwicks. The, these kind of players around them, you know, the, oh, now we're talking about the Owen Fowles, the Jamie Georges, James Shaw, Alex Wood, you know, that, that generation of player start coming through and now their role models and their vision is of, of these other guys and, and they just stepped up and they could step up because they had the talent, they had the ability and obviously they are now, you know, seven or eight of them are, the, you know, probably the starting British Lions, maybe, and uh, maybe, starting yeah. players and, and the spine of, of, of Saracen success. So it's, it's as I said, the players are, players are one thing, but they belong to a, a group a little bit like Leicester 20 years previous where everyone's so tight-knit Everyone's got each other's back. Everything they do, they know each other, they invest in each other, they spend time with each other, um, they socialise with each other constantly. And, and I see that at Exeter and I see that with other clubs as well, of course. Uh, but from my own personal experience, I, and, you know, be, being part of that as my first kind of real coaching gig um, was pretty special. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's it's interesting how you said that, like those, that the beers in Brighton was a moment that, it changed the outlook on the attack. And Saracens have always been known, especially recently, or even five, six, seven years ago, for the wolf pack mentality, for just those warriors like the Yaki's Burgers of these worlds, just smashing people, loving the defensive side of the game. And I actually remember being in Twickenham for the Claremont semi final. And I remember seeing that was one of the first real performances where defense being all blitz all line speeds all just make decisions make the opposition make their decisions twice as quick and i remember seeing the likes of brits like a burger not even caring about where their head ended up just flying off the line just tackle 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 and you won that game like at what stage since defense was your your baby so to speak like at what point did you think whether it was that season the season before because defense like attack goes through trends where sometimes yeah. it's aggressive, sometimes it's soft, sometimes it's a bit of both. At what point did you think, I'm going to absolutely blitz when we can? Was it a rule change or was it more the players you had, you thought, you know what, let's let's get after it? Look, I think I think it's probably a bit of both, really. Um, when I played at London Irish with Brendan, there was a very square... Uh, blitz ball watching defense. So, so I kind of did that when Brendan came in and he wanted me to be a defense coach. We both had a vision because we enjoyed playing within that. Because if if if, if you if you think of defense in a, in a context of you can either have a mindset of I want to get the ball back, or you can have a mindset that I don't want to concede a try, and both ultimately might lead to the same outcome. But your mindset and your way of thinking about how you structure your defensive system come from two very different places. It's a bit like when you play, do you fear losing? Or do you fear not winning? You know, like, and, and people, people, how you're driven intrinsically, your deep motivational drivers are, are different. And so if you, of, of the mindset of, I want the ball back, and we had some special players who could do broken field magic, because a lot of, particularly the first year, came from Scott Britt to Alex Good just being special. Like, you know, it's not, that's, that's not coaching. That's the fact that they can do things that other people can't and uh, could do, you know, relentlessly and, and repeatedly. And, and they were excited to do it. And, uh, you know, so, so if you have the mindset you want the ball back, then, then you have to think you have to take away time and space. So as soon as you're taking away time and space, you need to have something around line speed. So that, that's, that's in, in principle what we thought of. And um, we want to be more violent, we want to be more aggressive, um, wanted, to, wanted to utilize the players we had. We weren't the biggest team. And um, we, we, we thought when we looked at Europe – um, that we would we could struggle against teams if we try to contain and contain and contain. So, the blueprint from the very go was to win everything um, in terms of in terms of our internal mindset. The, the outward thing was to make memories. So we took away the burden of took away the burden of victory, and the idea was let's let's get after teams that try and create uh, chaos, uh, create unstructured attack to allow some of the players that we had to run Kameli Rituvu, uh, Alex Good, as we mentioned, Scott Brits, like we spoke about, Ernst Jubert. And then obviously lastly, you've got the guys like, you know, Owen Farrell and these guys starting to kick in. So that was that was kind of the idea. So when it started off, I was my first presentation on defense. We had this kind of, you know, keynote or PowerPoint probably in those days presentation. 
Yeah. And start talking about things. At the end, you know, as, as emotion gets into you and you talk and you, and you get excited about what you're talking about and you believe in it and so on. And we suppose, like, you know, we want to get after people. We want to hunt. We want to hunt like a pack, like a pack of wolves. And then Andy Saul, who who was a very promising open side, um, did a wolf cry. He did a wolf cry in the meeting. And then two or three boys followed it. And, th- and that was it. That's how it started. It wasn't, I went in saying we're going to be wolves. So then I thought, oh, well, I like that. We trained and the boys did again wolf whistle at the end. So I got some T-shirts knocked out, which said raised by wolves. And um, that was the kind of slogan for us for the year. The next year we had born to be wild. Uh, the, the third year was like hungry like the wolf. And like just every, everything was based around it and the slogans in there about the strength of the pack as the wolf and the strength of the wolf as the pack, Rudyard Kipling. And kind of we just played to it. And obviously now it's, it's, it's manifested itself um, throughout the club and throughout the community that people recognize wolf pack and Saracens. You know, I should have yeah. probably trained about it at the time, but it's probably got itself connected there. And certainly as of the first year was a very special year in terms of how few tries were conceded. And my last year in 2016, um, I think I think by January before I left, we'd only conceded eight tries. You know, the team was just going to a different level. Like I said, it's not it's not that the coaching, you know, I, I probably had improved as a coach, but it, it was as much the fact that the players were just getting better and better and better. And, you know, the Vunapolas are now at the club and they're now 25 and 26. And when I kick on Owen Fowles, just this like machine that can go forward and Maratoji started coming in. And the team just had this life and vibrancy about it and just believed they can do anything. And um, as you see, you, you see constantly with Saracens, if they get ahead, they're so hard to claw back. They just keep, putting the pressure on, putting the pressure on. You make a mistake because you're chasing the game at seven points. You know, that that, that that lethal at that time. And, and yeah, I think it was just a, a group thing that collected and um, it was quite organic, which is good. And um, as I said, we just kind of played on the words a little bit around the wolf. Yeah. I still think it's evident today, as most Leinster fans would know, that uh, performance in the Aviva there was pretty humbling and special. Feels like yesterday, even though it was technically last season, but you can t- still tell that those those principles that were discussed when Venter walked in the doors, they're still still remaining true. And like when you finish there with Saracens, you get your reunion with with Eddie. He uh, asked you to come on board with England, which I'm sure was a exciting, daunting proposition. You could put loads of different words to describe it. But similar to maybe what he did with Saracens. And he's huge about even self-reflection, getting the best out of his coach and constantly trying to be ahead of the game. Did he sit you down and more or less, like how did he approach it with you? Was he like, I want you to be an even better Paul? Or was it a case, listen, I think the world of you, we're going to be fine. Like how did he deal with you coming on board and taking the step up to the international setup? Um, look, I think the first thing we, we saw him, he, he came to watch Newcastle play. Um, against Saracens and I saw him in the airport um, after, after we kind of flying back to flying back to London <laughs> and he said uh, I've seen him for years he's obviously been coaching Japan and, and, and so on so I hadn't seen him for a while so we had a brief exchange he said look I'll give you a shout in the week and it wasn't I think he'd just been appointed or was just about to get appointed then he rang me on the Wednesday and I missed his call and then 20 minutes later, he rang again and I missed his call again and I, I just had a, a little boy not so long before that, and uh, he needed his, needed his nappy changing, right? So the most mundane thing we've got, you know, arguably a, a very influential uh, character in, in my own personal career calling me, and he's not one that you want to leave calling all the time. So I rang him back to look, I, I apologize. Um, you know, but my son needed me, he needed to change his nappy. He said, well, you see, your country now needs you. You know, I want you to be, I want you to be the next uh, defense coach, finger, which is quite a, you know, quite a strong thing to say in a pretty, Eddie's a pretty magical way with words. And, um, you know, it was pretty, pretty nice to hear. Uh, we had a conversation around the potential role and uh, he gave me two days to think about it. And to, and to be honest, for two days, mate, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to do it. I was so happy at Saracens. Um, I felt the club were, you know, on the precipice of domination. You know, the, 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 all these guys, that said the Vunapolas, the Farrells, uh, George Cruz, uh, Jackson Raynor, Jamie George, all, all these kind of guys, plus two or three of these these big international players from outside, you know, coming from the top of the gene pool. Really felt wanted something special. And they looked after me and my family so well. And uh, I said the experiences and, and the, again, that brotherhood, that, that, that thing we had was strong. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do it, but... You know, my, my dad always told me to regret the things you do do in life and not the ones that you don't. So as it turned out, as a staff, we went out on the Friday 
and it was just before Christmas, we were my Christmas do, I think. And uh, at 10 to 5, I had to make the decision. So I rang my dad again, and those were his final words. So I then went and told Mark and um, Phil Morrow, who's the head of athletic performance, uh, bought them a tequila, um, which is often the way. Uh, we had a few tears, uh, not to get the tequilas back and said what I was doing. And, um, you know, it was tough. It was really tough to leave the club, really tough to leave the club and had a very emotional kind of farewell do. And Alex, as Alex can do, spoke brilliantly and, and a, a brilliant farewell with all the directors there and everything else. And it was special. And I got to England, um, you know, two days later. Uh, we had, you know, two days of preparation, really, as, as a coaching staff and support staff because there was a lot of new faces there. Yeah. Eddie kind of allowed me and Steve our own kind of breathing space, really, probably probably me more so as well in, in terms of coaching. And, um, you know, it really worked. We, 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 I think we only conceded four tries in the first Six Nations, obviously won the Grand Slam. And then after that, went to Australia, first ever series win in Australia. Um, we, we had an unbelievable performance um, in, in the second test. But we conceded a few tries, you know, the first test and the third test. And, and you can look for excuses. You can say it was the end of the season, you know, you know one or two players maybe missed, missed something and it wasn't systemic, it was individual. But but kind of that's when the pressure came on really in terms of improving. And look, I'm not I'm not someone that kind of rests on laurels and, and tries to sit still. I'm always trying to move forward. Um, but he's definitely, definitely challenges you to grow. And it's, it's important. It's important that you grow. We ask the players to get better. So, of course, the coaches must get better. And the better the player gets, the better questions the players get, the more confidence they get. Therefore, you need more answers, you need more solutions, and you need to stimulate them more because if we come back to our very first minute conversation, coach's job is to create an environment and uh, facilitate the growth and uh, the betterment of the player. So I, I found out in that first, that first Six Nations, there was, you know, there, there was some challenges in it, of course, in terms of uh, being away from home and all that kind of stuff. But, but fundamentally, it was just a, an unbelievable experience because the team had bounced back from not getting out of the group stages in the 2015 World Cup as, as the first home union uh, to winning a Grand Slam. We went on a, this remarkable run of, of, of victories, um, finishing, finishing really, uh, unfortunately, at Lansdowne Road with some, some pretty murky decisions, I, I'd like to say, <laughs> uh, and uh, missing, missing out on, on a second successive Grand Slam, but having already won the Six Nations the week before. And, but we equaled the world record number of wins uh, with New Zealand. So it was, it was a pretty phenomenal kind of period of time. And Eddie's drive, uh, dedication and, and clarity was, was astonishing, really. It was astonishing. You know, he's, he's, you know it's, it's been said about him that he's a, he's a master coach or master coach. Sorry, I'm from Newcastle. So some words don't quite sound right, but he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a master coach. Uh, thinks about the game relentlessly, um, thinks about growth relentlessly, thinks about how he can challenge me and support me to get better and provide resources and, and, and make me think about things deeper, as well as all the other staff, not just coaches. Um, and it was just it was just a you know a phenomenal kind of period. But but you know, for, for, to say Eddie's just all about challenge would be wrong, because he's also about support. He also helps you improve and also gives you ways. And, and if you spend time with him, like he's just he's he's good he's good fun on a beer, like he's good crack, you know. And he's got a, he's got a great sense of humour, and um, you know, for all that stuff that Eddie put together, I think Eddie would be the first to say that that things only work because the players work, you know. And and I think anyone looking now, probably over the last four years, people generally think that a large proportion of the best players in the British Isles are the English players. You know, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's exclusive. I'm not saying that everyone has the same opinion, but you could imagine a British Lions team. You wouldn't you wouldn't have thought going into this season if a Lions team had, I don't know, Vunapola, Jamie Georgian, maybe, um, you know, Atoje, uh, Tom, Tom Curry, Owen Farrell, um, Anthony Watson, you know, like there's six or six or seven. You you wouldn't you wouldn't be too far away saying they could be in the starting British Lions team. Never mind some of the other guys. Like they they probably were established enough and thought of enough uh, Billy Vanapola as well you know like, probably not not much debate about those guys being the best in their class so those players uh, really made things work and, and there was guys that obviously started just missed out in the World Cup the Rob Shaws the Cares um, you know the James Haskells Dylan Hartley you know, other guys that helped that transition uh, immensely yeah and with say the setup being England it's always interesting to hear coaches' perspectives, whether they're head coach, assistant coaches. Like that time, as you said, was exceptionally successful. Like I remember being at the Lands and Row game when Ireland beat England and like there was just shock really. There was such relief we won, but 
England were this force at that time. They just, everything was clicking. But say yourself, when you come in to that England setup, Eddie Jones had multiple phrases, damaged goods, all this type of stuff after the World Cup heartbreak. Like, what were some of the challenges? Because with Saracens, you get a full preseason, you get time, you get good results, bad results. You might have an easy club game against a weakened side. With international rugby, there's shorter time periods. There's your England, so it's massive expectations for every game. You're dealing with the best players from multiple clubs. Like, was there any immediate challenges or anything that caught you off guard, guard in uh, the international setup? Look, it's a, it's a great question. I think you, firstly you have to obviously reevaluate how how you coach because time is time is your your, your least least uh, least uh, biggest commodity. You know, I, I've got a lot of time because you're in camp, but coaching time I don't have so much. And the way that the the training program was being run, I think were very very intense and very very quick. And so you're coaching on the run a lot and you've got to try and use your meetings and individual meetings and, and, and also have absolute clarity about what it is you're trying to get. If you're trying to get across more than two things or three things, then it's too many. So you have to think about what's the most important. Um, as time goes on and your message gets across, then then obviously you're trying to layer in and layer in and layer in and layer in. But you've also got some player turn up at the same time and it's almost up to them to get up to speed and your time out of camp, tell them to get up to speed. England's England's biggest issue, really, where they fall behind a, an island in some capacity, is they're not centrally contracted, of course. So there is some of the access is limited. the The game time is is um, at the behest of the club, and and you know marginally a little bit from the RFU because they pay for that privilege. But but it's not a program run like Ireland. The flip side of that coin is we do have twelve teams. We do have an EQP status. There is seventy-five percent of the of the Premiership are English qualified, you know, give or take, um, week in week out um, in the league playing. So there is there is people to choose from, um, but it's not it's not you know I, I think for England to really kick on and move forward and move forward and move forward, I think it's always going to be the debate around the central contracted situation. Um, you know, and I think that's that's for Eddie. Um, I think that's for, from where he comes from and where he's about high performance and about England winning and England winning. You know, he has his, he, you know, he has his flag on a certain mask. If you go to a, a DOR of a, of a rugby club, they're going to be thinking something different. That like the club has to come first because that's 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 what's most important to you. So there's always going to be this debate between them. But I think you know, as I said, going, going back to kind of the most important challenges is recognizing your biggest constraints: time, uh, new players. Um, on top of that, new players with nerves. You get players that are nervous around a group that are coming in. So you're trying to identify who could maybe fit into that environment. And then you've got, you know, you've got to get your personality and what you want to get across to a to a changing landscape. Because what happens in international games is that is the game moves way faster than the club game, and you know teams change and evolve uh, a lot more uh, with more speed. Generally, you know, it is it is what happens. We generally follow the, the Tri Nations. You generally follow what New Zealand have done, um, and you know you've got to try and find a way to break the mold and break conformity. Because that's probably what most people see now when you watch rugby, and you know, obviously, at Quinns ourselves, we had a very similar playing style to, 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 to everybody else because it kind of works and, and it makes people feel comfortable within that. Um, and you've got to try and find something at international level because the margins are so small about how you can be more successful. Good players help you without a doubt. You know, good players help you without a doubt, but you need more than that. You know, you need good coaching, good program. Um, you know, and that's not just just rugby program. That's a holistic well being program as well. Yeah, no, well said. And you then you departed England, and like I, you've already stated as to like your reasoning for taking on the Quinns challenges and um, some of the personal and professional reasons. So I don't want to get into that. But when you go from the England setup on the eve of obviously the rising is the World Cup, but you're obviously excited about taking over Harlequins. From even your own personal view, there is a step up no matter what. It's international to club. Going from an assistant to a head coach and some of the coaches I've previously spoken to have done the same transition. There's a lot of reassurances needed. They have deep thoughts whether they're ready for it. Some of them are overconfident. And then in hindsight, they're like, maybe I should have actually spent another year or two 
like personally yourself when you took on the Quinn's role as a head coach or DOR, like was there any doubt? Did you look at maybe Eddie Jones for consultation? Like how did you deal with the the job offer and ultimately come to the conclusion that you were ready for the role? Yeah, yeah look, I, I think I think obviously I mentioned I'll briefly touch upon it because it kind of puts things into context, but we, we had a kind of family kind of tragedy and I had a third child at the same kind of time. So I was kind of in a headspace where I need to be around my family a little bit more. I was aware quite a lot and I wasn't sure if I was opposite side of the world to get back if anything happened that I'd be able to be able to forgive myself. So that kind of prompted me to look for, for something different. Uh, I was approached by by the club. Um, had some other opportunities when I when I when I looked around, but you know, kind of living in London, I, I knew quite a lot of the guys there. It seemed to be a team that were underperforming, and there was some some big work to be done. You know, there's big transition in the squad required, and, and, and other bits and bobs. But going into, it, I, I think I think the first thing is you never know till you know. You know, to to take to take a, a leap into something different, like going from Saracens to England. You know, I, I never know if I could be a success there or enjoy it. Uh, or add value until you do it. You can be as prepared as you possibly can, but it's like you know, Mike Gerard Tyson once says, everyone has a plan to get punched in the mouth, right? <laughs> and and until until you go there and you're running a program and everybody everybody's looking to you for an answer through media, through logistics, through organisational, through strength and conditioning, through medical, through the rugby program, through individual players, through recruitment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's all these kind of strands that come to you. And it wasn't that I was unaware of, of what I was potentially letting myself into or getting into or getting excited about. It was more maybe the amount of time required for some of those things. And 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 sometimes I got things wrong for sure. You know, I invested too much time in things and didn't do what I what I what I really wanted to do all the time, um, but but I'm really pleased really pleased I did it. And you know we went from I think the year before I joined finished joint eleventh to finishing joint fourth. Uh, second season last season we you know weren't quite as successful. We finished sixth with a terrible injury crisis, but got to our first final in four seasons. And this season, unfortunately, with with you know we, we only I think I only played five league games before before I left and. You know, lost to the two at the top of the tree, Bristol and Exeter, which obviously lost to again lately. And, um, you know, two bonus point wins with the biggest ever victory at Northampton. And Drew was London Irish and that was it, you know. So the, the club now has got all their big players back, the Esther Hazens, the Levis, the Morrises, you know, Marchant, uh, Joe Marler's retired from international rugby again. And and the club, club's well set, you know. The, the, the starting team is as good as anybody's. It, it, they've got some breathtaking players and, you know, Marcus Smith coming to, to his own and Don Brandt, these kind of guys. So it's look, it's, it was it's really exciting. And what one day, you know, I'm going I'm going over to Benetton, of course, as a as a as an assistant kind of head coach. And um I, I always wanted to do something um prior to secondary school. My, my oldest boy's eight. So I kind of knew in in October time that I'd I'd be looking for something different. Uh, originally I was looking for Japan as it, as it, as it happened, and then this opportunity in Benetton came up. Uh, I used to play with Fabio at, at Saracens, and um, you know I was really excited about it. You know, it's a two-hour flight away. It's near Venice, and it's a club that's struggling. It's a club that's struggling. You know, a little bit like Harlequins. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, team hasn't won a game in the Pro 14 this year. Um, you know, they're, they're obviously looking forensically, and there's a there's a there's a saying that success leaves clues, uh, but so does failure. You know, and and so you got to look. You got to look there and see narrow down the two or three things that you can really target and fix rather than trying to do, you know, 1% here, 1% there, 1% there. Look for the big rocks. Look for the things that are that are systemically wrong or organisationally wrong. And, uh, you know, I'm really impressed with Marco Bortolami and uh, the GM, uh, Antonio Pavanello, that they, they, they really switched on. And, you know, Italian rugby's been struggling for, for a couple of seasons. Two years ago, I think probably as a Leinster fan, you can probably remember... Remember, um, Benetton going there and beating them. You yeah. can, you can two years ago, Benetton win the playoffs, and they've just kind of lost the way a little bit. So, you know, part of my role is is to help help the coaches, of course, and and help Marco, and obviously try and get the team to, to a situation where we can win more win more consistently, um, and and keep producing players for Italy. You know, like Scotland, I guess they're a, they're a two team nation. Um, you've got uh, Benetton and, and Zebra. And you know, there's no reason with with some of the players they've got that we can't make you know big strides. And uh, part of that's planning, part of that's programming, and um, you know, some some fresh voice, some fresh impetus. And uh, as I said, well, as, a, as a family, uh, for an adventure, for for something to try and help the kids grow resilience and grit, which is kind of the the in vogue thing uh, I think you want for your kids these days. Um, you know, every, everything seems aligned for us. We're really looking forward to it. Yeah, I know it is an exciting challenge, and as you referred to, 
it was only really two years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, where Treviso were really on an upward curve, both domestically and in Europe. And then ever since, as you said, there's just been a bit of a stall and even the the international team has come under some flack after making some marginal gains in the years before. And with, say, someone like Treviso, you're not going into an England or, and say, midway through your Saracens time where you're really, you're humming, as you said, it's it's somewhat a damaged group or the confidence may be low. Like when you look at an opposition or, sorry, a team like that, an opportunity like that, like yourself, I know you haven't started. I know the season hasn't begun and it may be a bit, bit premature to ask, but like, do you have even yourself, do you say, hang on, I want to get these guys back to the playoffs or I want Treviso to be consistently performing well. Like if you take someone like Edinburgh under Cockerell, they were very inconsistent beforehand, but then once he came in, they would rarely give up easy uh, wins to opposition. They got playoffs. They were consistently performing, getting internationals. Would you be looking at something like that, or do you have a particular goal yourself? Look, look I, I think obviously we, we, you know, from where we are to where we want to get to, there's there's some there's some steps to be made, and you know we don't we don't want to be where we are now, you know, it or depends on don't want to be where they are now. And um, obviously, in, in my mind, I've got a vision about what that looks like. I think it's important that with the playing group, that you co-create the vision. Um, you know, you've got to got to have absolute clarity about where you want to get to. Uh, you got a roadmap about what it takes. You know, I think the first thing is, what, what is it? What is it you want to do? What is it we want to achieve? Second thing is, what's the price? You know, what's what's going to cost you? What's what's it going to take in terms of resources, in terms of effort, in terms of dedication, in terms of sacrifice? What's it, what's going to take to achieve that? And then the third thing, you've got to ask yourself as an individual, as a coach, as a, as a, as a player, as a staff member, are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to make those sacrifices, do what's required, do the improvement, do the extras, invest in what you need to invest in and so on. I think, you know, those things, I think, as a group, that's the exciting thing. And some of the, I suppose, the pedagogy that, I, that I'm taking with me and, and, and thought processes and reflections of, from my learnings as a professional coach, you know, we can integrate some of them. And I, I also want to learn from them. You know, I, as I said, it's not just a, a one-way thing. This I need, to, I need to learn and improve as a coach myself. And, you know, something I've always spoken to Eddie about, you know, coaching in a different environment, coaching in a different place, obviously a different language. Um, will have its will have its own issues. You know, I'm learning some Italian now. I'm English, you know, sometimes isn't for Geordie isn't always the natural tongue either. So you're trying to pick up different bits and bobs. And you know, you know, the rugby language is very specific. You know, it's it's the you know, words that you use. Although there's not a plethora of words that you're going to be talking, it's a different to an everyday kind of language that you're going to be using. So, look, there's, there's lots of challenges. Um, but but I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm re- really really excited about it, and it's something I've always wanted to do. I, I never played abroad as a player. I had some opportunities to go and play in France, but never never fancied it. And um, you know, this this having spoken to some friends that played over there, the likes of Fraser Waters or Wasps. Um, you know, to, 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 to name but one, you know, Will Johnson that went over there and played there. I used to play with, with the Leicester. Um, loved it, loved the experience, loved the culture, loved the learning, um, loved the other opportunities um, that they get. And I said, I, w- I want to go there and improve myself as a coach. I want to improve the team. You know, as I said, team first is important. You know, you've got to, first of all, think about um, what my role in that is. So what's what's... You know, some people might say the number on your back for me, I'm a coach. So what's what's my role as a coach? What am I asked to do? How can I um, act up to my roles and responsibilities? So the second thing is the, is the badge on the, on, on the shirt. Like how can I pay to the club? How can I give value to the club? How can I add value to the club? And then the final thing is your name. You know, it's your name and, and it's your individual qualities and strengths and weaknesses and, and how you have all your idiosyncrasies and, and nuances and stuff and how you can bring that to the betterment of the team and the organization as well. And uh, like like I said, my wife in particular is very excited about it. Uh, the kids think we're going on a holiday for a couple of years, so they're, they're pretty excited about it as well. So it's um, it, it's all it's all looking good. Good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, no no doubt, exciting times ahead in the Gustard household. And just the last thing I want to say, and just one or two people did send on the same question, um, along with a few others, but just this one to focus on. And I touched on it earlier how especially now when you're back in with Treviso, you'll be looking at the latest trends in the game. And obviously defense is it's a big part of the game, along with set piece and attack and whatnot. So at the moment, as I said, about a year ago, everything was all about line speed. When you thought of maybe Saracens, when you thought of even England dominating 
uh, New Zealand, South Africa in the World Cup. It was kick-heavy game plan and outrageously fast uh, line speeds, just smothering defences. When I've looked at rugby this year and the observations of pundits, people within the game, it seems like it's nearly there's a less less aggressive line speed le- seems to be the case, and maybe perhaps the mindset is now let's not concede tries. Like what what do you view as the the current state of defence? Like is it very much rule and force? Is the breakdown tougher to slow down? Is it the energy? in the stadium with the lack of crowd that people are finding it tougher to get up, get off that line. Like where do you see the state of defense at the minute? Look, I think, I think it's such a, it's such a, it's a, such a hard thing to quantify, isn't it? The, the impact of, of lockdown, COVID pandemic on people's, you know, state of mind, um, you know, where they are emotionally, um, Week to week, you know, when you're wearing masks and meetings, you can't talk, you can't socialize, you, you're having to eat food in a car, you, you lose that connection. And it's been an incredibly tough period for, for, for lots of people, of course, and we've been very fortunate in sport that we've been able to do the things that we wanted to do. But but still, you're not building that kind of harmony, which obviously now you, you get an opportunity now to really build and build on momentum and so on with teams. I think you can see in defense, obviously, it's, it's a big energy thing, defense. You know, it's, it's if I give you an image of a, of a, you know, a 20, 20 high rise block uh, or, or flat, say. Well, to build that could take you a year or nine months, 10 months, but to knock it down, it'll take you 15 minutes. You know, being destructive um, takes less less thought, generally, generally less thought, less, less, less time necessarily required. So I think the key to good defense is keeping things simple, keeping things where things can be autonomous. I think most people would still agree that you want to put pressure on the opposition. Because if you allow teams to come towards you, there's so many big, physical, abrasive um, ball carriers, um, motion behind the line, that if you allow teams to play onto you, you're always in trouble. So I I don't think anyone's mindset is changing from being, let's be more sit and wait, sit and wait, sit and wait. The team that probably did that more than anybody would have been France. Would have been France, would sit and wait. They've got some big players that sit and hold the space in the field, keep four or five metres apart sit and hold and the catch up and the, the wait till you get towards a touchline, bundle you. And they were very good, even before Sean, very, very good. Now that you can see they press, they press, they press, they press. The interesting thing about this is to, to constantly press and to constantly hit is it requires a certain amount of energy. What's also happening on the other side of the coin is our teams are now trying to play more possession. You know, so you, 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 you know, teams are encouraged to try and keep the ball, keep the ball, keep the ball because – the law kind of lends itself a little bit to that now as well. So if you're constantly trying to go forward and go forward and go forward and you don't win, and the ball keep ball, keep ball, keep ball, it's hard to constantly go, constantly go, constantly go, constantly go, because the acceleration, deceleration for big heavy men stops you. So I don't think, you know, mindset-wise, um, people are not trying to get off the line hard. I just think there's a there's a fatigue factor because both sides of the ball, you're trying to use energy constantly. You're trying to go harder with attack and keep the ball for longer phases, particularly obviously from, well, anywhere from your 40 to the to the opposite line. You know, as I said before, no, no one plays anything different. You know, it's just, it's just where you kick from is the only different thing. Some teams will, in their 22, just kick, one phase kick. Might be to the 30, might be to the 40. And then you've got this play area between the 40 and the 50 or the 40 and the opposite 40, where teams, again, will have a different amount of phases in their mindset. Then after that, teams just keep ball. And then, you know, everyone's a version of it. Everyone's a version of one three three one. Everyone's a version of two four two. And then it comes down to the quality of players you've got, um, how inspired and motivated they are, and the quality of your coaching. So specifically on D, I, I still believe that people want to want to go. The, the biggest thing for me around defence is always going to be the question around spacing, and 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 a general kind of fold policy, if you like. Um, and then the final thing I would add to that is the backfield cover, because obviously space in the rugby field is either either outside you, it's either through you, or it's behind you. You, you know, and 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 from a, from an attack, you're looking at these different spaces where you want to attack. So defence, you're trying to protect those spaces. So I think spacing is the one thing that teams will vary. The wider you go, you feel you fill the field. The less I feel you can go forward, because to bring numbers to the line to sharp adjust and tackle. Um, and it, it's difficult. The tighter you go, you have to get off the line hard because you've just narrowed the field so much that three passes, teams are around you and they get on the edge of you and they go forward. Uh, you've seen a lot more of these kind of kick passes because teams are pressing so hard. Um, again, another way to try and kill line speed. 
You'll also see teams try and play off nine a bit more. Again, kills line speed because you're just trying to exhaust the tight five as much as possible. You'll see teams change direction a bit more, again, because you're trying to take away line speed. So when teams play a 1-3-3-1, one, three, three, one, they'll go to an edge, play those pot of three forwards, come back and work over that defense, back, back, and not allow this big press on the outside. Eventually what happens is the line gets tighter, then the play, then the play, then the play. So look, at as, as you, I think you, your words before, there's always cycles with attack and defense. Attacks, you know, you can see some big scores happening all the time, you know, 30 points here, 40 points there. Um, and, and, and teams, teams when they get hot, with all the, the, the talent there, that, that there is and, and the way that the laws are and the difficulty of stopping malls and stuff like that as well, you know, the amount of tries scored from malls, you know, this last kind of 18 months has been exponential. Um, you know, you, you can get the wrong end of a score quite fast. Brilliant. Yeah, no brilliant insight there, Paul. And yeah, that's more or less it from me. I do have a few quick fire questions before I let you go back to the labor intensive uh, work of the garden. Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, no, no, listen, that was brilliant. And yeah, just to finish on a, a lighter note or a less nerdy type of rugby note, uh, just a few questions. So, one, the first one that was sent in was the craziest or most bizarre thing you saw at training as a Leicester Tiger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that'd be tough. Yeah. That'd be a tough one to answer. I, I'd say one thing that kind of still, stick, still sticks to my mind um, would be we, we, at the end of training, for some reason, Andy Good that played, played at Leicester as well, uh, you know, exceptionally talented fly half. And uh, and exceptionally talented eater as well. As it, as it turned out. <laughs> he, uh, he was uh, he was playing with the ball, just doing nothing, nothing wrong. And then Austin decided he wanted that ball. He wanted to get that ball off 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 Goody. And uh, I was chatting to to Martin Corey, and uh, it was kind of I think it was the end of like a backs unit session. The back row had gone to join him, some skills or something. And um, we're going, he's in the almost breaking into a fight. And we're going, this is ridiculous over a ball. So I went and grabbed Austin. Yeah. And uh, Cosa uh, Martin went and grabbed uh, Goody, and they pulled him back, and they're still mouthing off each other about this this ball. Like, it's the most ridiculous <laughs> thing. And like you can't you can't mouth, you can't. Mouth. So I then um, Martin then let go of Goody, and I still had Austin with his arms behind his back and his head up, and Goody just <laughs> just, just straight across, <laughs> cracked him straight across the Swede. <laughs> and I'm, I'm holding on. I mean, Austin still reminds me about it now, to be fair. But um, I'd, I'd say. <laughs> There were so many moments at Leicester that make me chuckle and make me smile. Things in training, and and you mentioned before Richard Cockrell, like he could he could literally start a fight in a in a post box. That kid, um, and just just some fun moments, mate. Just fun moments. But that one with Austin because it was Austin. And he, you know, I, I don't think anyone would ever get tired of resting their hands on Austin's face. So it's uh, it's always a good thing. No, no. Uh, next up is the most naturally gifted player you've coached. Coached, I would say the player that needed the least amount of technical coaching would be Scott Britt. Like he was just absolutely phenomenal. Like I just I can't even begin to describe some stuff he did and could do. Um, his was more always more around tactical, like how he could stay within some form of system. Like we didn't want him to be a system player because. There's no point. You wanted to find space to give him the ball and all the rest of him. Played him in the backfield for a hooker and you yeah, know, like right. plays where he'd work. But you know, he was just he was just so outrageously talented. You know, throwing line out, throwing things that you know require a lot of effort. And you see people practicing all the time. He just didn't. He just didn't. You know? I'll go and do stuff with Jamie George, who is probably the best thrower I've, I've, I've ever seen. Jamie, like he's incredible to dedicate a lot of time to it. And Scott would just come out and just just throw the ball, and you, you have to think of things that would stimulate him to do clay pigeon shooting with balls to try and get him excited. And if it wasn't a game and it wasn't competitive, and he couldn't win something, or couldn't do something outrageous, or couldn't beat somebody, just not interested. But make it competitive and do something like a stepping drill or something. Just like oh my, like you just you know, no wonder people had ACL injuries. Like he was just outrageous. And 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 then there's guys you know like. Owen Farrell is so talented in a completely different way. Yeah. Um, but but what I think what most people think in terms of skill is the step, the womb, the ball handling would be that. I never coached him for as long as I'd love to have done, 
but one of the most skillful people and one of my most favourite players um, I ever played against and, and coached would be Charlie Hodgson. I think Charlie is without doubt the best passer of the ball I've, I've oh, he ever seen. He could was work them. incredible off either hand at pace, just a beautiful, graceful rugby player. Um, one of the most talented players of his generation, without a doubt, without a doubt. And whenever we played sale, whichever the clubs I, I, I'd been at, like the one person that decided whether sale were going to have a chance to win or lose was Charlie Hodgson. And uh, I don't think you can say much, much stronger recommendation about someone's talent than that. No. Uh, the fa- your favorite film of all time? Ooh, um, I watch so few films now because I've got three kids. <laughs> I seem to be watching like Moana or something, and I, I don't know if I can give that as a genuine answer. Um, what would I say? Look, I, I, it, it's a bit, it's a bit of a throwback this one. But when I first watched it, I still think about how it made me feel at the time. Um, you know the, the space I was where I was at would be something like Train Spotting. I, I used to I used to love that as a film. I thought it was kind of groundbreaking in its time. Reservoir Dogs, something like that. I, I probably, but I can't think of many films I've seen over the last kind of five to six years. It'd be easy to say Shawshank or something, but I, I'd, I'd probably say I'd probably say something like um, Train Spotting or over the last five years, the Taken, the Taken films with uh, with Liam Neeson. Yeah, probably oh, like one. 20 of those taken films now at this yes. stage. Yes, <laughs> okay, and I know that you're a you're a keen lifter in the gym. You were speaking about even with Quinns, how you'd be getting up at half five and stuff like that. So one of the people was intrigued. What is your most impressive lift in the gym? Because I know a few of the guys in, say, Ireland camp talk about how Andy Farrell pumps his iron before uh, games and gets after it. So I was wondering if you have any lifts that you'd be somewhat happy to boast about. <laughs> yeah, well, Faz is strong. Faz is strong, mate. He's a big man. He can lift. He can lift some weight. Um, what I do? Well, I think I think anyone that knows me knows it's it's not going to be leg based. So it wouldn't. It, it's, there's there's nothing in the car. So I still I still like running quite a bit. So I, I go for a couple of 10, 12 k runs a week and. and like everyone else getting a bit of crossfit nowadays so i would always be around bench mate always bench your shoulders um and then yeah i mean you can't quite see now but if my wife gets out of the way but we're just getting that garden done now you can still see like just oh dedication. yeah ready for dinner <laughs> <laughs> that's a warm up weight mate it's a warm up weight, <laughs> it's a warm up weight. Yeah, but I used to, I mean, probably, I think the heaviest I ever lifted on a bench, mate, this is going back a bit of time, and I'd be 150. So it's it's not spectacular by any means in the modern world. But going back going back 20 years ago, mate, it was a decent decent bit of tin. Good shift, yeah. What would be, so second last one here, what is your funniest amateur rugby story? So back in the day, or even if you were at a match, at an amateur rugby game. I played. I played. I played against so my my amateur team was uh, was Bladen, and um, you know Bladen famous probably mostly for for Mickey Skinner, and uh, you know a really progressive club, and um, they're the, 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 famous for their car boot sale actually, as, the, as they are as they are rugby. But um, we played a game, and I think I was I think it was eighteen. I just was at school. I just come out of school, and uh, we played a team that were I think it was Old Thorn Indians, and uh, very kind of physical, abrasive. Uh, let's say dirty, like they, they were, they were pretty, pretty filthy kind of team. Lots of stamping and punching and cheap shots and stuff. And I remember getting cheap shotted, just running like a support line, just some turned around, smacked me, smacked me in the, smacked me in the face. And I went like looking up, and I just saw like this kid being chased by five, five, five blame lads uh, from 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 um, from the team chasing. It was like Benny Hill sketch, just like this guy running down a field. There's five guys chasing them, and then you know some of the other Thorn Engine lads chasing them afterwards to get to them. And then after that, you know, that in itself kind of made me smile. And then after in the after in the bar, I think the uh, the local lads and Blade and a pretty tough 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 crew uh, mm-hmm. came down and um, kind of chased them out, chased them out of the car park as well. So that kind of kind of kind of reminds me about the normality of life and uh, yeah, like how rugby used to be a little bit as well. Yeah, well, hopefully coming to a rugby club in the not too distant future. And <laughs> lastly, and this is this is always the toughest one to answer. Um, describe yourself in three words. Um, uh, caring. I'd say caring would be would be one of my qualities. 
um, hardworking. Let's say I've got a got a strong work ethic, which allows me to grow, which allows me to fuel ambition, and I'd say fun. Good stuff. Well, no, well said, Paul, and I want to thank you again for coming on. I know we've gone slightly over, so I just I'm just thinking of the the bench press now, or else uh, the garden that needs to be seen to uh, before dinner. But uh, yeah, th- yeah. thank you for taking the time out, and I wish you all the best with your new adventure in Treviso. That's going to be an exciting exciting time for you and the family by the sounds of things so i wish you all uh with that and jeff thanks again for just being so open and honest i really appreciate it appreciate that richie thanks for your time mate